All right, so thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar um, for our Masters in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. We're gonna focus on research today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. So I am Dr. Leah Jeanette. I'm the Assistant Director of Education of Bioethics and Medical Humanities. I'm also a Senior Research Associate in the Department of Bioethics. And I'm also an alum of the master's program. I graduated in 2009 and I eventually went on and got my PhD in bioethics and returned to the department um, in uh, 2016. And um, I fill a couple of different roles, including um, directing our um, course directing our clinical ethics rotations. And I work with our incoming students. Um, and I've, I really enjoy um, being in the department and um, I'm just delighted to be with you today um, to talk about this topic. Um, so I'm gonna go over our agenda um, just briefly. We'll talk a little bit about Case Western Reserve um, School of Medicine. We'll talk about research in bioethics and medical humanities, the master's program, application process and deadlines, and we'll do Q&A at the end. Um, as we're going through, if you have questions, there's um, a feature um, here in Zoom called Q&A that allows you to submit your questions. There should be two like chat bubbles um, if you're on a desktop um, that you can click on and it allows you to type in your question. If you're on, I believe a tablet or a phone, um, there should be an ellipses, like three dots that if you click on that, um, it, it allows you to open up the Q&A feature to submit your questions that way. Um, I wanna introduce our panelists today. It's Dr. Aaron Goldenberg. He's the vice chair and associate professor of bioethics. He's also the director of research in the department of bioethics. Dr. Goldenberg, um, thank you for joining us. And I'll let you um, share a little bit more about yourself. Sure, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, so yeah, I am vice chair and an associate professor in the department, but I've actually been in some ways part of the department for now more than 22, 23 years. I did the master's program in 1999 uh, and then came back in 2004, did my PhD within the department and then stayed on as faculty and have worked in a couple different um, capacities within the department, both as director of the master's program for quite some time uh, and now vice chair. So uh, today I'm gonna be talking mostly about kind of research in bioethics and medical humanities, uh, research opportunities in the department, but I'm also happy to answer lots of questions about the program generally uh, and, and you know, have a nice uh, conversation with you just about kind of all things bioethics here at Case Western. All right, so to start us out, um, I'll talk a little bit about Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. So we are one of the seven schools here at Case Western Reserve University. Our School of Medicine is ranked number one in Ohio and we're ranked 24th in the United States specifically for um, medical education when it comes to research. Um, not only is research a significant part of the School of Medicine, but we collaborate across the university as well. So we partner with the law school and um, the business school and the social work, um, the social sciences and all the different um, schools here at the university. So it's a lot of partnerships, nursing, um, and I'm sure you'll hear Dr. Goldenberg talk about how we collaborate in these different projects within the schools, um, but also across our community as well. Um, the School of Medicine is a fantastic place for us to be located. Um, it really is um, the heart of kind of the connection to the other um, networks here in Cleveland as well, including four um, major teaching hospitals as well. And so it's a fantastic place for us to be. So, you know, one of the questions we often get when it comes to bioethics and medical humanities is why study bioethics and medical humanities? Um, I think this is such an interesting question. And I got this question, and Dr. Goldenberg, you probably get this question a lot too. More, I got this question more so pre-pandemic of what is bioethics and medical humanities? And I think the question has grown and changed over the last couple of years. And people are starting to think about it even differently now. 
um, because of the pandemic, but it's such a vibrant, um, interprofessional, interdisciplinary field. But really, because we have such constant advancements that lead to really big questions, um, and you can see some of these questions here, should we intervene? Can we ensure justice and respect for persons in research, in clinical practice, in how we conduct all of these questions that you're going to, um, these questions in research that we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But really, what kind of values should inform policy and practice? But because we have these constant advancements, there's a lot of things that, you know, we think about in how we move forward, where have we been, and how we move forward. And so the study of bioethics and medical, medical humanities plays a huge role in these questions and how we partner with those around us, um, both at Case, Western Reserve, and our school, um, in our community, um, in our nation and around the world, um, I think is really important. And so it's a, a vibrant field that really allows us to explore these questions in a really unique, um, very poignant way. So Dr. Goldenberg, I'm gonna turn this over to you to really talk about the landscape of research in bioethics and medical humanities. So talk a little bit about what does research look like in the world of bioethics and medical humanities? Sure, I, I think one of the questions I get from a lot of students who are thinking about the program or thinking about bioethics or medical humanities or health humanities as a career is, well, what, what, is, what do you do? Isn't it just teaching? Isn't it just you know going to lectures and learning? And, and that is a very large part of it, but all the faculty in our department do various kinds of research that add to uh, you know, the kind of thinking about public values and how public values drive decisions in healthcare, in research, in policy, in healthcare policy. And so what I thought I would do is spend a couple minutes just talking a little bit about um, different approaches to research in bioethics and medical humanities. What does it look like? Why is it important? What are some examples of research projects that are going on currently in our department? And then how can research uh, um, be a part of a master's student experience here at Case? You know, we have lots of opportunities for students to get involved in research, and I'll talk a little bit about a few of those. So when I think generally about research in bioethics and medical humanities, I think about kind of two main, I don't know, buckets or categories of research. And the first one is what you might consider more theory driven or normative research. These are projects that aren't empirical as in they don't kind of collect data in the same way we think about a survey or an interview. But what they do do is they create opportunities to apply theory to problems in healthcare and medicine, to think about how, for example, philosophical traditions or religious traditions might inform the way we build health policy, the way we think about what should happen and what shouldn't happen in health policy. And you can imagine uh, there are lots of different opportunities for researchers to think about um, how medicine should be practiced, whether or not we have a human right to healthcare whether or not we have um, uh, a right to reduce health disparities in our communities. And that kind of research is uh, very, uh, um, has been practiced for a long time in bioethics and medical humanities. And, uh, uh, you know, in bioethics, for example, typically will involve philosophers who kind of think about the philosophical traditions and the origins of bioethics. Um, and then the other side of research is, which is where I spend most of my time is, is in empirical research. So this is actually collecting data from different kinds of stakeholders. Those could be people within the public. Um, a lot of my research is in pediatrics. So I talk to parents a lot about what they think about different kinds of medical technologies like genetics. Uh, you might talk to professionals. A lot of our folks in our department interview doctors or nurses. <clears throat> You might interview policymakers and find out about how what their processes are, are, are like in terms of creating policy. And you can do so in a lot of different ways. There are surveys, you can do interviews, you can do focus groups or discussion panels. And all of this is to kind of collect data to be able to better inform the normative and theory driven research that I was talking about before. So if I'm thinking about what should happen in, in terms of, let's say, 
asking everyone to get a genome sequence, asking everyone to go get genetic testing done. I kind of want to know before I say what I think should happen based on theory, I want to know what people think about it. I want to know what people are worried about. I want to know how the public feels. And so really when you combine these kind of normative and empirical studies, we get to a point where our goal is to assess the values that drive policy and practice in healthcare um, and in biomedical research, right? The idea is to think about what values are inherent in the ways in which we do healthcare, in the ways in which we do research. And that is really at the heart, whether you're thinking about bioethics research or medical humanities, it's really about assessing those values and thinking about how to create better policies and better practice in healthcare and research that reflect human values, that reflect human rights, that reflects equity and equitable treatment of individuals and communities. That's really the heart of bioethics and medical humanities research. Go to the next slide. So these are just a, a very, very, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just an example of some of the projects that we're currently doing uh, here in the department. And I'll give just a couple examples. I'm not even gonna go through all of these. Um, I encourage you, if you wanna know more, I, we include the little uh, URL at the bottom here with um, different featured projects. So you can read more about these and other projects, but here's just a couple of things that we're working on right now. So the Cleveland African-American Prostate Cancer Project is a new project. It's a community-based project with our cancer center, with the uh, um, faculty in our cancer center, to create opportunities uh, for uh, community access to prostate cancer screening, including PSA tests and genetic testing, in uh, African middle-aged African American men who right now have one of the highest health disparities in terms of both screening and in, in terms of poor outcomes for prostate cancer. So the idea is to work with our community partners to better understand barriers to getting screened, motivators to getting screened, and then to work with for example, working with barber shops all over Cleveland to bring screening to communities uh, and to give more control over that information to our participants. So that's one uh, area. Uh, a second project that is, is listed here um, is the Framework for Advances in Reprogenomics, Ethics and Regulation. This is a project that's meant to look at the, a variety of ethical issues involved in um, the use of genetics in reproduction. Uh, and specifically around reproductive freedom and, and, and choices in reproduction uh, and how different ethical frameworks might be applied in the use of genetic information for uh, reproductive decision-making. We have uh, uh, faculty who work on the ethics of, of burn care and the difficult choices that uh, burn victims have to make under incredible pain and with all, uh, um, uh, a lot of questions around uh, how they can be part of decision making in their own care, given um, how injured they are, um, and and how do you think about decision making in the burn unit? We have uh, a project specifically looking at mental health ethics and the ethical implications of peer support and peer um, uh, counseling in mental health situations. Uh, something that's happening quite a bit in, in, in the mental health community is, is working with peers to try to give support to individuals with mental health um, issues. Uh, and what are the kind of ethical issue, issues and ethical boundaries? Um, so we so this is just a very, very quick kind of you know rundown. If you're interested in any of these projects, please go to our website. And, and this is just really, this is just a taste. Uh, of the various research projects that are going on in our department. Um, you can go to the next slide. And someone might ask, you know, and you can put up a couple more of these. There's, there's like two or three, there's a bunch of these. These are some of the kind of hot topics right now in bioethics that we're starting to think about, right? So gene editing, right? What you might call, you know, you, sometimes maybe you heard of like designer babies and how might we address gene editing? Uh, how do we deal with issues around GMO foods and public opinion around GMO foods? How do we create research opportunities that protect the privacy of individuals and communities when those research opportunities are online with social media and the concerns about people having our data? Um, issues of fetal, fetal tissue, tissue research and, and kind of controversial ethical issues with, with regard to reproductive freedom. Uh, as you can imagine, a hot topic right now, but it's been really a hot topic for a long time. How do we involve prisoners in research and how do we protect their rights? 
uh, as incarcerated individuals and at the same time allow them to participate in research. And then, of course, one of the hottest topics right now is how do you get community members to engage in research in ways that that put um, more, give them more expertise, give them more, um, give them more of an opportunity to give their experiences, their narratives to the research endeavor. So this is uh, one example of community engaged uh, research on homelessness. Um, but there are lots of opportunities right now to involve research communities in, in um, sorry, uh, underserved communities in research. Um, one of the things that we talk a lot about in our work is that a lot of times research happens to communities, not with communities. So people will come in and say, I wanna study domestic violence, or I wanna study access to healthcare, or I wanna study cancer. Um, and they don't really talk to the community from which they want to actually collect that data from. Our department is very um, strongly in favor of what's called community-based participatory research, which allows community members to be part of research teams, to give their opinions, to give their expertise, to give their voice to our research projects, which we think is something that's incredibly important in order to address really a, a long history of exclusion from research. One of the things that, that is a big deal, a big, big issue in bioethics and medical humanities research is the history of underserved communities being left out of research, both in terms of research being, re, being research participants and in terms of actually doing the research themselves. And our department is very much in favor of involving uh, communities in our research projects. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, this leads to a, a question that I get asked sometimes that I think is an important one, which is, what about the ethics of actually doing biomedical research, right? So we're in a med school, there's all sorts of research going on in the med school, anything from immunological research to vaccine research to uh, cancer research. And, and the other side of, I guess, if there's kind of two, you know, two sides is there's, there's research in bioethics that, you know, kind of the projects I've been talking about. There's also the ethics of doing biomedical research, which is kind of the flip side of, of research in, in bioethics and medical humanities, which is how do we help to make sure that research going on in medical schools and other research institutions is done so ethically? And you might be asking, okay, well, why, why do we need to have, you know, kind of ethics guidelines for research? And it's pretty important to make sure that we're protecting human subjects. We unfortunately have a long history in this country and other countries of people being abused in research studies. And we have laws and regulations and guidelines that have been put in place over the last 50 years to assure that human subjects are protected. That if I decide I wanna be in a research study, that I'm gonna be protected, that I'm not gonna be abused, that I'm not, my data is not gonna be used without my permission. Um, and so we need to make sure that research is conducted appropriately. We also need to make sure that there's equity in our research projects, that people have equal opportunities to participate. Um, one of the things that has come to light that maybe isn't super surprising is that many research studies over the last 50 years have not included women, have not included underserved communities like racial, racial ethnic minority groups. So one of the other things that's important in terms of research and bio, ethical issues in biomedical research is making sure that research is done equitably, making sure that there's uh, equitable participation and equity, uh, equitable benefit sharing. So why does it matter? I mean, it matters a lot for me, for our community, for, for students, because it's important to make sure that research is done in ways that respect communities, respect individuals, and protect their rights as they are research subjects. You can go to the next slide. So how are some ways that our master's students get involved in research and research ethics in our, in our department? Um, let's start with our research ethics concentration. So um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the program generally in one second, but students coming into our master's program can either do our kind of regular master's program, or they can also choose one of two main concentrations, one of which is on medical med medicine, society, and culture. So our, our medical humanities uh, folks run one concentration, and the other concentration is a research ethics concentration, which is specifically for students who are particularly interested in research ethics. They have, they have specific courses in research regulation. They do part of a research ethics journal club. There are some electives. Um, part of their time here is they do a research ethics practicum where a student might be, for example, placed with an IRB, an institution review board, and, and learn a kind of a practice and policy related to research ethics kind of on the front lines, really 
uh, really um, uh, kind of hands on. We also have opportunities both for people in the research ethics concentration and people in just any real, any concentration or any part of the master's program to also get involved in research in the department. If you go to the next slide. So we have a lot of different opportunities for students to get involved in research. It's something that a lot of our students are really interested in. So first of all, we have monthly research skills seminars. So these are opportunities for students to learn different kinds of skills related to research. That might be how to do a literature search, how to do interviews, how to collect data, how to analyze that data, how to write a research paper. We have opportunities for students to join faculty and staff on actual research projects. So we have, for example, research opportunities for students to come on board and help design surveys, help to write grants. These are really amazing opportunities for our students to really kind of get their hands on training and doing research and being part of a research team. We have bi-monthly research core forums. These are opportunities for the faculty to get together with staff and students to talk about new hot issues in research, to help each other with grant applications, to talk with each other about papers. We've had students, for example, who wanted to turn one of their papers from our program into a publication, and they've come on these research core forums, and we've given advice and kind of gone back and forth and helped them to turn their research paper into a paper that gets submitted to a journal for publication. We, <coughs> we also have a number of opportunities just to hear about research going on in the department and in Cleveland and nationally. So we have a works in progress seminar series that um, allows faculty and staff to talk about new projects. Metro Health, one of our community hospitals has a bioethics at noon seminar series where people will come on and talk about their, their work. And our university hospitals grand, ethics grand rounds is also a newer opportunity to hear about kind of cutting edge research at the intersection of bioethics, medical humanities and healthcare. Um, so uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I want to hand it back over to, to Leah, but that's Dr. Jeanette. But I wanted to just say there's if you were to come to our program, there's lots of opportunities to get involved in research. And we're really looking forward to, to, to working with you and to learning more about your research interests. All right, Dr. Jeanette, take it away. Fantastic. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, after learning all of that, the question often comes up of, great. Like I can, you can get involved in all these things. You can learn about all these things, but ultimately how does it help your career path? Right? So after you get involved in all these things, where do you go from here? Cause a lot of times students may not want to go into bioethics and medical humanities full time. Maybe you want to go into some type of clinical career, whether it's medicine, nursing, social work, maybe you want to go into a legal profession. You want to be a lawyer. You want to go into health law. You want to go into health policy. Um, perhaps you actually want to go into research or regulatory work. Um, the, uh, and there's many other directions as well, um, arts and humanities, public health, um, or maybe you're still trying to figure it out. Maybe you're looking for discernment on your direction. One of the great things about bioethics and medical humanities is it's such an interprofessional and multidisciplinary field. And that is true from its origin and that's true in its practice. Um, our faculty and staff come from a diverse number of backgrounds. Um, the educational background of everyone is such a variety. We have people that come from philosophy and law and medicine, anthropology, public health, um, nursing, um, bioethics itself. Um, but it's such a variety and it allows for students to get such unique perspectives and that's kind of the nature of, of the field. But I think one of the things that is unique that you can actually see in these research projects is that's who's collaborating on these projects as well. Um, and so, the, you know, as Dr. Goldberg was talking about some of those research projects, this, just the small sampling, um, those projects are not just done by a single faculty in our department, there's collaboration going on. And so, you know, someone comes up with an idea, but then they reach out to uh, someone else from another department or another expert, um, whether it's locally or across the country or even internationally to bring in their expertise. And they become very interprofessional and multidisciplinary research projects, which is amazing. Um, and so the program and 
we'll talk about in just a second, but the world of bioethics and medical humanities really can help launch students into their professional careers, into the next phase. And so this can be an opportunity for you to do, this, to do that, um, which is really great. So our master's program, um, we're gonna be celebrating our 27th year this fall. Um, when students do the program full-time, it's two semesters. So you can start in the fall and you'll graduate in, you'll start in the fall, which is typically August, um, and you'll graduate in May. So it's a nine month program when completed full-time. We do also have part-time opportunities, um, but we're gonna um, highlight kind of the full-time pace right now. Um, when students join the program, it's 30 credit hours. Um, we match students with a, um, a faculty advisor and they really work together to personalize your sample or your curriculum course. We have core courses, of course, but those elective options, so 13.5 out of the 30 are customized um, for each student. So you really can get the most out of the program to launch you into the next phase of your career path. Um, as mentioned, we have two optional concentrations, medicine, society, and culture, and research ethics. We have dual degree program options. Of course, you have to apply to each program independently. And as we mentioned, we have research opportunities for students as well. So in order to apply to the program, um, we require um, transcripts from all undergrad and grad programs. Statement of purpose, what we're looking for is you to write about your interest in the master's program, specifically in the world of bioethics and medical humanities and how does it fit into your overall career path, resume or CV, two letters of recommendation, including one from a faculty or professor. Once we have a completed application, we will review and interview you um, by our admissions committee members and a decision can be typically rendered two to three weeks. Sometimes it's actually a little shorter at this point because we're getting close to our um, deadline. So um, if you are still interested in joining us this fall, we are still taking applications. The deadline, the final deadline for joining us this fall is August 1st. Um, so I just wanna make sure that that is highlighted. And of course, orientation and classes begin this August, which is just around the corner. It's hard to believe. Um, so I know that we're very close to the end of our time, but I wanna give an opportunity to answer any questions that may come in um, from those who are um, in attendance. So I wanna make sure that there's an opportunity to ask questions now. If you have any other questions, you could always email us um, bioethics at case.edu. It's a great way to connect with us. Um, and we can um, either set up um, a specific appointment with you to talk about your um, specific question, your um, um, special circumstance to better understand your um, situation and really um, talk about your specific interest in our program. Not seeing any questions coming in right now. Dr. Goldenberg, do you have any final thoughts as we wait to see if there's any questions? Yeah, I'll just say that I think that it's um, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this particular webinar is that sometimes it's easy to separate out, you know, kind of the education parts of our department and the research parts of our department. And one of the things that I really love about this department is that the things, the, the, the different areas of work are really integrated. We involve our students in our research our lectures involve uh, talking about research projects, not just research that happens at Case, but research in medical humanities and bioethics nationally and internationally. And so it's it's really a, a great opportunity for people to um, get a master's in bioethics, but also in, in, in medical humanities, but also really engage in national and international conversations about really important topics in healthcare and health policy and, and research. Yeah, and I know we've heard from a number of our alumni that as they are moving on to the next phase of their career path, that the research skills that they're learning in our program, either through going to our research skills seminars or through practical, you know, joining a project or just from, you know, experience of learning it on the, you know, on the job through their projects itself, um, learning this, the skills through this program has become very valuable to them because so many students come in with research skills, but it often is um, based around hard science, right? It's lab, it's bench research, which is very important and has, you know, a significant 
um, weight when it comes to certain um, career paths, but it's not the only type of research out there. So it's definitely this, the skills that you're learning is definitely um, something that can stand out on a resume and can take, can, you can take with you beyond the length of our program. As oh, well. absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions, but I will thank um, Dr. Goldenberg. Thank you so much for your time and sharing with us. Absolutely. And thank you all for being on and feel free to email or, or let us know if you have any further questions. Happy to talk anytime. All right. Thank you so much.